followers everywhere, I'm e and welcome to e Talks. I'm an 11-year-old literacy advocate, podcast host, and now Giving Tuesday Spark leader. And that's all thanks to my guest today, the legend himself, the Giving Tuesday kindness legend himself, the director of youth engagement and outreach for Giving Tuesday Spark, the one and only Dante Plush. It's such a pleasure to have him here because fun fact, everybody, you might not know this, but along with being a kindness champion and leading a global generosity cause, Dante is also a comedian and was a middle school teacher. That's pretty cool, right? Sharing humor is as a fun way of connecting with youth. Perfect. And it's true that laughter can be a healing and unifying force, but there's more, and that's why we're here today, to shine a light on everything that Dante Plush is doing for our world, from teaching to giving Tuesday spark and all things Dante. And on that note, thank you so much for joining me today, Dante. It is such an honor to have you here. No problem. Thank you for having me. This is, like, awesome. I am flattered. Thank you. So, my my first question, and I'm sure all of our listeners are curious as well, I think that we'd all like to hear a little bit more about what Giving Tuesday Spark is, as well as what does your role as the Director of Youth Engagement and Outreach kind of mean? Okay. Wow, this is like one of those problems in like a, a math test where there's like five different parts and yeah. you have to like show your work. So mm-hmm. you stretch. Okay. So uh, to start with your question, um, I think before I could answer what Giving Tuesday Spark is, I may have to talk a little bit about what Giving Tuesday is. Mm-hmm. Um, so for high audience, Giving Tuesday is, it's the nonprofit that I work for. Um, and Giving Tuesday itself is a global generosity movement that started in 2012, which I was a freshman in college when it started. Um, And it aims to change the world through getting everyone to do random acts of kindness throughout their life. Um, And the idea was to get people to spread kindness through social media as it was just getting popular. So back in 2012, this is probably when you were like, born or really young, um, there were things starting to go viral. Like this is, at this point, Facebook was the big social media thing. So me and all my friends, yeah, (laughs) were on Facebook and things like Coney 2012 were happening, which is this like viral social media campaign where they're showing um, youth in Africa being forced into being like child soldiers. And this guy was asking people to donate money in order to kind of help stop Coney. Um, So there's things like that happening. And that whole thing ended up being a mess. But that idea of let's use social media to like spread messages and whatnot, from what I understand was the precursor to Giving Tuesday. So people saw that like memes would go viral or pauses like Coney 2012 would go viral. So our CEO, Asha, and then the co-founder, Henry Timms, um, they had the idea of, well, why don't, why don't we try to make kindness go viral? Um, so they came up with the hashtag Giving Tuesday. The hashtag was in its early days in Twitter. Um, they created the hashtag, and then they just started the movement through that. And um, it has gotten super popular. Um, today, it has manifested in many ways, probably the most prominent being the it's like the biggest fundraising day of the year for most nonprofits. Wow. Um yeah. And while that's cool, because like I think last year 2.7 billion dollars uh were given in the USA alone in 24 hours to causes that people care about. So like lots of money. But while that's like awesome and everything, um we're trying to move the focus away from that. So we don't want everyone to think of us as fundraising Tuesday uh, because that just, you know, it just it when things revolve around money, it gets messy. And that also just kind of leaves out people who don't have money or can't donate to a fundraiser. How can they participate? Um, So we're working to keep the focus on all types of giving, like giving time, volunteering, volunteering kindness, uh, sharing your creativity, sharing ideas, advocating for someone else, self-care, stuff like that. So everyone knows that they have something to give. 
um, because we truly believe that the one thing that we have across Sorry. age, race, nationality, gender, political affiliation, everyone has the ability to be kind. And we also know that like when someone's kind of kind to you, you're more likely to kind of want to communicate with them. You're more likely to understand them. You're more likely to want to be kind to them. You're more likely to, you know, it's just things seem like they'd be all around better in multiple ways socially if everyone just kind of did an act of kindness every once in a while. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the big idea around Giving Tuesday. Okay. Um, Spark is the youth division of Giving Tuesday. So uh, this was 2019. I was still teaching in New York City and a young girl by the name of Chloe Thompson DM'd Giving Tuesday and she was like, hey, this is super cool, but how do kids get involved? And so two of the colleagues here at Giving Tuesday at the time, they were like, oh, this is a great idea. And they created this campaign called Giving Tuesday Kids. And they talked to like a couple of other organizations and um, they said, yeah, we'll get our kids to do something on Giving Tuesday. And then that first Giving Tuesday, they got around 10,000 kids wow. in the world to do an act of generosity. Um, so then they were like, okay, this idea has like potential, so let's keep it going. So then they brought me on and then we brought it, we rebranded it to Spark and then that's its current form today. And Spark in itself, like I said, it's the youth division of Giving Tuesday, but it's still kind of a little different. Um, we focus mostly on non-monetary generosity because as you know, most kids don't have money yeah. to give. And also, you know, kids can fundraise, but um, let's just say kids don't have the fundraising teams that adult nonprofits do um, for their causes. So we keep the focus on non-monetary generosity and we have the goal of like rearranging power to those who don't usually particularly have it and making sure that all youth know that they have something to give. And we do that in a myriad of ways we're like a community so we have like we're a movement and a community so we have our core community which you are part of of spark leaders and they all kind of yeah you each have your own focus and you do you make change uh according to things that matter to you and you guys communicate with each other and you share ideas and you support each other and through that you know leaders have gotten like boosts in the work that they do they've gotten like networking opportunities, all sorts of stuff. Um, and then there's an outside world watching this and they're seeing the things that you guys are doing and they're like, oh, that's kind of cool. I kind of want to do something like that, but I don't know how. And then you guys post your social media, just kind of being relatable and showing like how you do what you do, why you do what you do. And then other kids are like, oh, okay, let me try that. And then that's how we see the giant wave of kids that come out um, on Giving Tuesday to do projects. Last year, we saw about 47,000 kids do an wow. act of generosity around the world. Well, everybody, if you don't want to join Giving Tuesday Spark now or Giving Tuesday, I don't know who else is going to persuade you to do it. Dante, that was awesome. Now I want to join Giving Tuesday all over again after <laughs> that introduction. And... Also, what is it that you do? Like, what's your job really mean? Great question. So technically, on paper, my job is to grow and maintain Giving Tuesday Spark. Mm -hmm. um, but that literally changes from year to year, what that means. Because um, funny story, I kind of have, I don't want to say autonomy over my job, but as director, I kind of have most of the say in what happens with Spark. Mm -hmm. Barring, like, if giving, as long as Giving Tuesday is like, okay, like, they just want to make sure I'm not out doing crazy radical things. But most of the time, I get to do whatever I want with Spark. And Spark is youth led for our audience. So when I say youth led, I mean most of the things that we do are pretty much told us by the spark leaders they're like oh yeah this would be cool if we did this 
And so a lot of times you just focus on making those things happen. So a lot of my job is making things happen that the leaders come up with or think of, um, creating strategies that help us have, like create our big wave of kids that come out giving Tuesday to do acts of generosity. Um, also maintaining a year round community of leaders and young people participating in generosity because it's awesome to do something nice one day of the year on Giving Tuesday, but what's really going to lead to impactful change over time is consistently doing generosity throughout the year. So it's my job to kind of create that program of, well, how are we going to keep the leaders engaged in generosity all year? How are we going to support what they're doing all year? How are we going to make sure they don't get burnt out? How are we going to build community amongst them? And how are we going to make sure the outside world sees this so they're inspired and they want to do stuff like the leaders? I'm curious to know, what age did you start sharing jokes? And when did you know that you wanted to be a professional comedian? Hmm. This is also, like, I guess a little bit of a story. So I started... I think when I was really younger, like I was really close with my aunt V and we would like make fun of song titles to songs. And that was just a thing that we did. So this was back in the 2000s, um, the early days of like the internet. This is when like MySpace was the thing. I wasn't on MySpace, but um, MySpace? We would just, exactly. It's, it was the precursor to Facebook. Okay. Um, so yeah, we would just make fun of song titles and then um, they would be funny. And then like my aunt would make like little mannerisms um, that I would kind of copy and we just thought they were funny. Um, and then we just think of like funny scenarios and whatnot. And then, I don't know, I got into college and that's when I really started noticing um, that like I liked writing per se, but only if it was like comedic writing and in college it was uh I was such an edgelord oh ugh. like I was just very like oh this is dark and offensive and like that's kind of the type of stuff I came up with in college um but it was creative enough for this comedian who knew me through my fraternity um well he knew one of the founders of my fraternity he invited me on stage and um I went on and I completely bombed, but I had enough stage presence to make it seem like I at least belonged there. Cause like people came up to me afterwards and they were like, Oh, and I was like, yeah, it was my first time. And they're like, really? That was your first time ever. And they're like, wow, you have a future in this. So I was like, interesting. So like I started investigating that and like I go on stage again and again and I was horrible for like years like it took just bombing year after year after year um but eventually I started like you you'll bomb like three shows or four shows and then you'll find like one joke that kind of works and then it's just that cycle of continuing until you have like a set and then continuing to build on that until you know and I just stuck with it. And I think I a year ago, I decided, because I stopped once I got the job at Giving Tuesday, because I was like, I need to focus on that. I can't lose this job. It's a miracle that I got it. Um, and then I decided I was kind of missing out on my creative outlet. Because um, like when you work with kids, you always have to be professional. You always have to be a good role model. Mm -hmm. um, so I was missing kind of like that escape. And so I started doing comedy again last year around this time, but I vowed to myself, I'm like, I'm going to make the comedy palatable to all audiences and also combine my work of philanthropy into it. So like I get to host comedy shows now that like raise money for um, funds for things that happen. The most recent one, there's a fire in the Bronx last year in the area that I used to teach in and we had a benefit and we got to donate money to a mayor's fund and then help donate items to a politician in the area that was collecting stuff for the people who survived the fire. 
well, that is pretty cool. And I'm just shocked that there's so, there are people out there who are really good at jokes because everybody just, like, there's crickets in the room when I make a joke. Um, <laughs> and speaking of um, jokes, what is your go-to? When you're at a comedy event, what's the first joke you lead off with? Or if your best is your last, what's the best one that makes everybody laugh? <laughs> uh, I have this joke that I say, um, I tell the audience, I'm like, yeah, you know, I, uh, how do I start off? It's, it's 2022 now. And I have a boyfriend who loves me very, very much. And the audience is usually like, Oh, and they clap. And I'm like, yeah, funny story. We actually, uh, were supposed to go to the gym together earlier, but we got caught up in a really deep conversation about potentially getting married. And then everyone's like, <gasps> and then I say, yeah, I'll do anything to get out of exercising. And then people use your like, oh, that's horrible. But like in a laughing type of way. That that was good. <laughs> that was that that was good. I wanted to see how that one where that one was going. And that <laughs> that left off in a really good place. Yeah. I can see why you're a professional comedian. Thank you. That was pretty funny. Um you're way better than my dad. <laughs> Although dad he's jokes. editing this, so yeah. There are some dad jokes that like really work. There are. Or maybe I'm just cringy and I like dad jokes, but there's some that are like great. And there's others I'm just like, you knew what that sounded like before you said it and you still said it anyways. Yeah, that's definite. My dad would definitely agree with that. <laughs> Although he would say all oh, the worst jokes, the best jokes. So yeah, anyway, um, <laughs> this one. This question isn't necessarily related to Giving Tuesday or comedy or any of that, mm -hmm. uh, but it does have to do with so stopping someone from being unkind. I read that you did a lot of research on cyberbullying. Right. Um, so can you offer any advice for kids that are being cyberbullied? Yeah. So the thing with that research was um, I came to the conclusion that a lot of people don't know that they're cyberbullying when they're doing it. And I think that there's this like weird culture today where people are, they have this idea, they say like, everyone's so sensitive and everyone's so whatever, and you can't say anything because everyone gets offended. That's um, and then like these people go and just say the most like grotesque and like horrible things for shock and that really have not much value whatsoever um just because they think everyone's too sensitive or whatever and um I guess the advice that I want to put out there to people I think two things is one sure words don't hurt like people love to say sticks and stones may break my bones but words will never hurt me words can't physically hurt you but words influence ideas mm -hmm. and ideas can definitely hurt you. So while you may not intend on like hurting people with your words, you can absolutely influence people with your words and people have more power than you think. People have the power to vote. People have the power to, you know, go out and do some pretty bad things. The only thing that stops us from doing bad things is the fact that we shouldn't because it's not a good idea but sometimes it doesn't stop people so not to get philosophical but that's my first piece of advice like words influence ideas and ideas influence actions and my second piece of advice um is that you don't get to decide what offends someone or what is you don't get to decide someone's boundaries. Like it's very healthy to set boundaries for ourselves. And some people have some boundaries that are here. Others have boundaries that are out here, but I don't get to determine what your boundaries or what you will accept as E-Train are. And no one gets to determine what anyone else's boundaries are. So if someone doesn't like something or they prefer that you don't speak to them in a certain type of way, Give them that kindness and respect that because they're more likely to give you that kindness and respect back. And then we'll have a world where we'll want to communicate and actually work with each other instead of just kind of be beefing with each other all the time. Mm -hmm.
that's, I love that. And you are so right about both of those points. I, I've, I've got to go tell my friends that because <laughs> it's a pretty, middle school is a pretty dark place. So hopefully if it's I really tell them and they'll tell others, it's, it, it, it's really me. It was horrible. I taught it and kids would say, kids would bully me. They'd be like, hi, huh, you're fat. And I'm like, I'm literally your teacher. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> So I also read that you're a social studies teacher and what grades did you teach? Well, now I know you taught middle school, but how did your work or did your work in education inspired you to begin your Giving Tuesday Spark journey of spreading joy worldwide? Hmm. So the first answer to your question, uh, I taught sixth grade social studies. Mm -hmm. Like in New York City, you elementary schools like kindergarten to fifth grade. And then middle school starts at sixth grade. Yeah. Um, so when I was a kid, I grew up in Jersey. Um, we started middle school in seventh grade. So that was already foreign to me. But um, yeah, so I taught sixth grade. And that experience, it's also a little long of a story. I'm sorry if I'm talking too much, but uh it's fine. It so I was I taught like I said, in the Bronx, in New York City. So if you're not familiar with the Bronx, it's a very, like, tough borough. Like, that's where, like, Cardi B is from. That's where, like, very tough people are from. And in the Bronx, um, I mean, not in all places, but there, there's crime that happens in the Bronx. There's, you know, I mean, that stuff's everywhere. But for some reason, people tend to highlight it a lot in the Bronx. There's crime, there's violence, there's all sorts of bad stuff. Um, but there's also really good people. Um, but anyways, so in where I taught, I taught in the southern part of the Bronx in the most the, in the poorest congressional district in the country. And um no one prepared me for what the job would be like because I went to school in like rich Westchester, and it's like one of the richest counties in the country in New York, and uh I started teaching in the Bronx and I would be like, hey, do your homework. And then kids wouldn't do their homework, for example. And I'd be like, okay, I'm failing you because you didn't do your homework. And then they'd be like, I don't care. And I'm like, what do you mean you don't care? You're going to fail. If you keep failing assignments, you're going to fail the class. And they'd be like, I don't care. I'm like, oh, no, I know you care. And then like, eventually they, they proved that they didn't care. And like, I would try to call their parents and they'd be like, hey, your child isn't doing their work. And they say they don't care if they fail. And then the parents would be like, oh, okay, I'll talk to them. And then like, nothing would change. And then like, I, I another problem was a lot of kids just weren't coming to school. So like, they would come maybe two days out of the week. And they were just like chronically absent throughout the rest of the school year. And after maybe like, the third month in, I just started noticing everything else. Like kids weren't eating unless they came to school and got the free lunch. Some kids' parents weren't coming home. Some kids would have to stay home to watch their siblings. Um, some kids, like their parents wouldn't come to parent-teacher conferences because they're afraid of being picked up by ICE. There's just a whole lot of things going on. And I'm like, dude, these kids are literally like 11 and 12. None of this should be affecting them. And it's gonna keep them from learning and I can be the best teacher in the world but if like kids aren't eating or their parents aren't supporting them or like all this stuff that's going on outside of school isn't like is going on that's going to impact their grade and their learning and their development way more than me so I started doing some advocacy work on the side and I started just kind of like doing a little fundraising for community-based organizations that helped um, kind of deal with what I call barriers, which is some of those things are just listed. Um, and I used Facebook fundraising because again, Facebook was the thing at the time. And, um, one day this lady was in my DMS and I didn't see it. And I thought it was spam, but she was like, Hey, I'm a casting director for Facebook commercials. And, um, I want to feature you in a commercial. And I was like, huh, go away, bot. But then I was like, maybe there might be something there. Let me just 
try it anyways. So I responded and she turned out to be a real person named Sky. And um, well, one thing led to another and I got flown out to California to be in my first Facebook commercial. And that's how I got to know the Facebook social good team. And they, one thing led to another um, and they had me speak at a press conference of theirs in 2019. And that was when Facebook was announcing a $7 million match for Giving Tuesday. So I spoke there about like the work that I was doing for my students um, in the Bronx. And then the Giving Tuesday team was in the audience. So then they approached me after it and they were like, that was really great. Um, and then they talked to me about, you know, possibly taking a job with them. Um, and then like, I accepted, I didn't want to leave my kids like right, you know, in the middle of the school year, because how am I going to be an advocate, but then abandon them once something cool comes up. So I said, okay, I'll work for you giving Tuesday. Cause I thought that it would be a good opportunity to one, do networking, two, learn stuff, three, figure out some way to come back to the Bronx and then take everything I learned here and then use it for the kids there. Um, but I was like, I'm not leaving teaching right now. So they're like, okay, you can do part-time work for us at night and then do full-time teaching at the day. And I was like, great. And then COVID hit. So that was a whole mess. Um, and then once I finished that school year, I went full-time at Giving Tuesday under the promise that I can run the program how I want and I can use it as a vehicle to help kids like the kids I taught in the Bronx. So how I designed Spark now is pretty much so that even my students in the Bronx can participate in it. And there are young people in the past who are like Bronx influencers and like Spark leaders who I've worked with. I actually tried bringing one of my students who I taught into the Spark group at the time, oh. but he, his mom wasn't very on top of it. And in the beginning, they were like, yeah, this seems great. And then, you know, they just eventually were like, they disappeared. But yeah, that's what I'm doing now. And like I said, when I say like non-monetary generosity or like rearranging systems of power, really it's kind of code word for, I want to create an equal playing field for the kids kind of got me into this work in the first place. And, you know, actually make change inspired by what I saw them go through every day while they were just trying to learn. What is the greatest act of kindness someone has done for you? The greatest act of kindness that someone has done for me? Oof. For me, I don't know. I, I feel like a lot of kindness stuff in my life revolves around just the work that I do. Um like that ad advocacy stuff. So I would say that when Facebook agreed to come visit my school, um, the social good team, they agreed to come visit my school and talk to my students and then just learn about their lives. And then they also donated, they made a donation of $10,000 to my school wow. um, following the visit. That was probably, I was like, okay, this is, because I actually felt like I made something happen. And it wasn't just like a photo op. It was people coming to our school to talk to kids in the hood about jobs in tech. And then afterwards, just talking to them about their life, just sitting and listening instead of just like doing that thing that people always do, which is just like, yeah, like photo op. Yeah. So how's that? Shout out Facebook social good team. Yeah. How can everybody else who's watching or just everybody in general, how can they join Giving Tuesday Spark and Spark, I did it again, a little bit of kindness in the world? Um, let's see. So you can get involved. Anyone can get involved in Spark. And that's what we're trying to do with the movement. Like we want to make it so low barrier to entry that it's realistic for an average everyday kid to participate. Because, I mean, you do a lot of amazing things with your books you train, but like yeah. not every kid is interested in being a mm -hmm. book advocate or whatever. Some kids are just like, I just want to hang out with my friends. And so 
we say, okay, well, just like leave a post-it note, a kind post-it note on, you know, your friend's locker or something. Like things as small as that, you never know whose life you could be changing by doing that. You never know who is having a really, really bad day or has really bad mental health. And your compliment, you never know if your compliment can encourage them to start, you know, taking steps to bettering their mental health or speaking out to someone about what's wrong. And so just, you can get involved by participating on November 29th, doing a small act of generosity, writing someone a kind letter, making a donation to a cause that matters to you, giving someone a compliment, um, donating a can of food to a food drive, painting a kindness rock, playing a game of free rice. We have a free rice challenge there that you participate in. Um, or go on social media and advocate for a cause that matters to you, like E-Train does. Um, and just take a picture of yourself doing it and share it to your social media with parent permission, of course, uh, with the hashtags Giving Tuesday and Giving Tuesday Spark. So now I'm really curious to know, and I'm sure everyone else is, what are you currently reading? Or what was the last book you read? Or just what's your favorite book of all time? Oh boy, okay. Huh. Most recent book I read slash what's my favorite book of all time? Hmm. So I always was like, I was a very weird reader. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I didn't have the attention span to pay attention unless it was certain like books. So like if I picked a book I was really interested in, I was just going through it. And then, yeah. And so there's been a number of those books. I'd say my favorite book that I've ever read is this... It's going to be funny, kind of, but it's this old feminist novel called The Awakening by Kate Chopin. And they made, um, they in, when I was in high school, they made the AP literature um, kids read it. And I was never in AP literature, but I was like, I heard some kids making fun of the book and I was like, I'm going to read it anyways. And then I read it and I was like, this is a feminist masterpiece. And it's about this lady named Edna Pontellier and she has everything. Like she has this perfect life. She has a rich husband named Leons and she, you know, is rich and she's on vacation in Grand Isle, Louisiana, but she's still not happy. She's not happy having to be a servant to Leonce all the time. She's not happy with just the expectations of, you know, her as a mother and everything. And she wants to be an artist. And there's this lady she meets who she wants to do art with. And she wants to go out and have fun. And she wants to do whatever. And it's kind of just a story of her kind of rebelling against her husband, rebelling against her expectations as a woman in like 1898 and rebelling against expectations of her as a mother and everything and I don't know I was just like a 16 year old boy reading this and I was like you go Edna and I don't know just it was always a good book I find that most books that I like a common theme in them is like a rebellious woman mm -hmm. so like another book that I really liked was Carrie by Stephen King that was like my first book that I read all the way through and this was in like seventh grade thank you so much for joining me today dante on behalf of everybody watching i mean i don't like speaking for people but i'm sure we all feel it you are the bomb not like how you bombed your jokes like <laughs> the bomb uh and i just know that everyone is so inspired and has been so inspired as much as i have to find ways to show generosity and spread kindness in their communities. The work you're doing is so noble and important <laughs> and just amazing. And I'm so proud to be part of the Giving Tuesday Smart community. And everybody, you can be too. All you got to do is make someone smile, put a kind note, or you can also join some of us leaders and ambassadors our projects for giving Tuesday Spark because we're pretty cool, although I'm kind of biased. <laughs> so everybody, 
This has been my interview with Dante Plush, the Director of Youth Engagement and Outreach for Giving Tuesday Spark. Dante spends his days empowering young people across the globe. Yeah, across the globe. To take action on important social issues, as well as spreading kindness and changing lives. One spark at a time. Had to say it. My favorite line about Dante has to be, and I found it while preparing for a talk, a guy walks into a classroom. The punchline? He changes lives. And that's what Dante is doing now. In a bigger classroom, the most important classroom, in fact, our world, world, world. That's all for today, everybody. Stay safe. See you next time. And go to www.givingtuesdayspark.org and start spreading some joy. Yeah. Later, everyone.